Okay. How are you all doing today? So I've been asked to get this show. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Outstanding, outstanding. I've been asked to get this show on the road. Uh, my name is Greg Washington. I'm the dean of the Henry Simmons School of Engineering. And uh, we want to welcome you all here today to our, <clears throat> what is our quarterly alumni event. Uh, this is our second time together jointly as uh, the School of Engineering and the School of Information and Computer Sciences in the Bay Area. And uh, uh, last year's event was a great event. This year's event is turning out to be a fabulous event as well. Um, what do you think about all of this? Pretty cool? Give them a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. It is a fabulous venue, and I got to tour some of all of this, uh, some of the projects they're working on today, and it it is it is fabulous to see uh, what the company is not only doing now, but what they're actually preparing for the future. And so you'll hear some about this later. I don't want to take I don't want to take Aaron's thunder. Uh, but this is this event is primarily to do two things. Number one, we want to bring all of you together uh, here uh, to get to know us a little bit, and for us to get to know you. Uh, we we also uh, savor the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the institution and the great things that are happening. Uh, I can tell you definitively that your UCI degree. Your UCI degree is worth more now than it ever has been, including the years that you got that degree when you all graduated. Let me see by show of hands how many people uh, have graduated since the year 2010. Those graduated since 2010. Okay. Let me see those who graduated since the year 2000. Since the year 2000. Let me see by show of hands. Okay, those that have graduated since the year 1990, since 1990, okay, those that have graduated since the year 1980, 1980, anybody graduated before 1980, let me see a show of hands of all those before 1980, this is great. So let me tell you a little bit about what's happening on our campus. Uh, we continue to grow both engineering and information and computer sciences. Engineering now is over 3,300 uh, engineering students and in information and computer science at the undergrad level. Information and computer sciences is over 2,100 uh, engineering students. And uh, just to put it in context, uh, when you, uh, you know, if you look at Berkeley or UCLA or Santa Barbara or UCSD, the uh, engineering and computer science at those institutions are combined. And so when you look at the total number of students and, and those programs, only University of California San Diego has a larger student body than the combined student body of UCI and the, uh, and, and, you know, the Brent School of Information and Computer Science and the Samueli Schools of Engineering. And so that's a big deal. Um, we are producing more engineers and computer sciences at the highest level than virtually any UC institution in California. And when you take into effect, when you take into account that one out of every 10 high school graduates coming out of high school today are actually graduating in the state of California, that's a big deal. The students are also incredibly bright. The students are incredibly bright. Just last year, the average entering GPA, average, of our students was a 4.09. 4.09. Think about your entering GPA. <laughs> I actually, I, I tell the students all the time, look, your dean would not have gotten accepted. <laughs> Hal would have gotten accepted. But I wouldn't have gotten accepted. <laughs> Coming out of high school, I just, uh, well, I, in the humanities, maybe. <laughs> but not in <laughs> 
And so that's how good the students are. Uh, but the students aren't just good. Uh, more than 30% of our students are low income. We're approaching 40% of our students are, are, are first generation. So they're the first in their families to ever go to school. And UC Irvine as a whole is doing some fabulous things as it relates to impacting uh, families of people with uh, low incomes. Um, we have more Pell Grant eligible students than the whole Ivy League combined. So you take every one of those schools. And Harvard likes to tout how they're the school that's reaching the masses. No, we're actually the school that's reaching the masses. And, and so uh, when the New York Times did a study and they said one institution in the country is having the best impact, the broadest impact of, stu of students from diverse backgrounds, of students from low income backgrounds, and they looked at that ranking, UCI came out number one of, on, of every institution in the country. Because not only are we bringing those students in, but we're graduating them, and, and when they graduate, they leave and they do incredibly well in industry, just like many of you all are doing today. And, and that's just the beginning. There are a whole host of, I, you know, I used to say that we were the number one institution in the country under 50 years old. We're no longer under 50 years old. <laughs> I can't say that anymore. We're, we're, we're about to turn 51. <laughs> uh, you know, number three in the world, under 50 years old. Uh, and so we have to put all of those accolades away. But what we see is that as we put those away, we're graduating into a broader echelon and a bigger category, and we still continue to do great things. When we pit our students up against the students from the very best institutions in the world, when they have to compete on the same projects and the same venues, our students do it. Uh-oh. You know what that means, right? That's my hope. <laughs> our students do extraordinarily well. And so you all should be thankful uh, uh, and, and for what the students today are doing and, and the impact that those students are having. But they should actually be thankful for the impact you all have had for them because what you've done is you have blazed a trail that has made it easier and better for those student graduates. On that note, please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> now, we couldn't have had this event today without the hard work of some extraordinarily uh, dedicated people. Uh, Kristen Hurth in the back, you probably all heard from Kristen. Kristen is the reason for the season. She's the one that makes this event possible, and she does a fabulous job. Uh, we're now, uh, we're taking UCI global. <laughs> so we're not just, you know, we, we did a, a, an event in uh, Los Angeles area at Sony Pictures last year, and that event was a huge success. And we came to the Bay Area, and that was a huge success. And we said, well, let's just try, let's just stretch it a little bit more. Uh, this uh, what, a couple last months month. ago, last month. Yeah. last month, we went to New York, and uh, come to find out, one of our alum has uh, uh, and what is it, an American in Paris, uh, one of the very, one of the best uh, plays on Broadway currently today. It's, it's by an ICS alum, and believe it or not, put that computer science degree away. But <laughs> <laughs> Actually, actually, believe it or not, he still, there's a lot of technology involved in this, and our students are actually working on projects for, uh, for his company. But anyway, he hosted this huge event, alumni event for us in New York, and that event uh, turned, out, turned out fabulous. Uh, we have a lot of alum working on Wall Street, believe it or not. And, and it, <laughs> What in, they, they, they had nothing to do with 2008. And, and, <laughs> and so uh, we're going to continue these events. We're going to continue to expand them. As you meet other UCI alums, those who are not uh, here tonight, please engage them. Bring them to these events. These events are for you. They're for you to connect with us, but they're also for you to connect with each other. 
So I want to introduce to you my partner in crime. <laughs> We've had a great working relationship between engineering and ICS uh, over the past five years. I've been here for five years. Hal is now going into a sixth year. It's his sixth year. And um, it's just been a tremendous partnership. Uh, there was a time when you, there was literally an open grudge match between the engineering dean and a computer science dean. You know, you put them in a room and lock the door and then make sure the walls were padded and you just see who comes out. We're not doing that these days. We work very, actually, they would lose. <laughs> tasting early. <laughs> uh, but uh, our, our partnership today is fabulous. We have a great working relationship and uh, that relationship is going to continue to grow and to prosper and the, and the biggest beneficiary of that is all of you. So I want to bring up my partner in crime, Dean House Stern. For the Thank you very much. Greg's very hard to follow. He, he speaks so well, and the battery can also run out. So, <laughs> um, so if the if the ICS and engine, the engineer D went out of it, Greg would win the, the wrestling part. But then we go to the math questions. <laughs> so, um, um, I again want to echo some of what Greg said, and thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I, I've told several of you this one on one, but. The UC campuses in general and UC Irvine in specific did not do a great job of keeping up with their alums. And so that's really made a very high priority for me, for Greg, uh, for the campus as a whole. And we were basically on the ICS side doing one alumni event per year, always in Orange County, and you just don't get out and meet people. And so we made a concerted effort um, on both, I think it's on both our sides, about 15% of our alums which totaled up would be 3,000 plus are in the Bay Area. And so it's crazy for us not to be up here. Um, because we want to be connected with you, we want, we, we have, um, through the companies you work for, we're interested in projects where student teams can help. Um, recruiting, of course, is a big deal. Um, we always are looking for mentors for a variety of different things. And so, you know, making a connection, finding out where you are and what you're interested in is very, very important to us. Um, I want to add a couple of things to um, what Greg said, tell you a little bit, a couple of things going on on campus, and then we're going to have two um, relatively short um, but informative talks, not like Greg in my comments. Um, so uh, things I wanted to mention were, um, you know, one thing about, that like Greg talked about the numbers, um, my guess is next fall will probably be 6,000 across the two schools because they just finished the admission cycle and we're both way up. Um, so it's really quite remarkable. And the thing that really threw me this year, I have to say, is ICS numbers are up 25% or 30% over last year. The campus actually asked us to take more freshmen because they need to take more California residents based on the deal that we struck. Um, so we took 25% more students and all of the metrics went up. The GPAs, the test scores, it's, it's a little mind-boggling if you actually think about that. So, so really special time at the campus in terms of the quality of our students. Um, the other thing I wanted to make everyone aware of because uh, we are trying to create more opportunities for uh, professional training. And so within ICS, we just had a, approved a master's in human computer interaction and design. Um, and it's, uh, op that one is gonna be online and starting next fall. And so if you or people at your company are interested, you should let us know. And both engineering and ICS are spinning out a number of <coughs> programs of this type. That's the first one that made it through the Byzantine University of California approval system. Um, but so we're very excited about that. That's something to keep a lookout for. Um, on the research side, I want to mention something that's really just getting going, which is uh, the two schools with and the law school and the School of Social Sciences are about to spin out an uh, institute on cybersecurity, which is just a critical, critical issue these days. And uh, the genesis actually is Los Angeles law enforcement reached out to the dean of our law school, a uh, relatively famous guy named Erwin Chemerinsky, um, that they need help. 
and um, that's a starting point, but every company needs help, every person needs help. And so we have a meeting actually Friday with um, 60 companies slash organizations, government organizations, uh, coming to Irvine. We're gonna have a meeting, we're asking their help, tell us what you need exactly so we can build this institute to kind of provide what's needed. So uh, really fun time and, and a lot of great activity. Uh, the last thing I was asked to mention was uh, last year in the support of the 50th anniversary celebration for UCI, we're the best university under 51 <laughs> <laughs> in the country. Um, we, we kicked off both engineering and ICS uh, Hall of Fame for some of our distinguished alumni. So 20-some-odd um, ICS people, 30-some-odd engineering people. Um, and that's intended to be an ongoing activity. And so uh, we will be kind of opening up nominations again later this summer, and we'll do something a little smaller than we did for the 50th when we rolled it out. But um, that's another way we want to kind of stay in touch. Um, so with that all being said, I want to make sure um, to uh, thank you again all for coming, and we'll say a little bit more at the end. We have a few giveaways and the like, but I want to turn it over to the two folks who are going to have speak. So we have um, an ICS alum who works at, at Autodesk, and I'll introduce Aaron in a second, and then you're going to hear from one of the ICS faculty who does some, at least tangentially, related work in um, simulation and, and design. Um, so uh, let me first bring up Aaron Bradner. Uh, as I said, ICS alum and a research scientist here at Autodesk who's going to talk to us a little bit about what goes on here. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so I'm Erin Bradner, um, and I had to look at my badge to remember what year precisely <laughs> I graduated. I graduated from the ICS department in um, 2001, and at that time it was core. Um, if anybody, I see some chuckling back there, so if somebody recognizes that acronym. Um, so, uh, and thank you so much, um, Dean Stern and Dean Washington. I l really um, love seeing the two of you together and the engineering department and the computer science department together because we've been talking about convergence. And um, in fact, I am living convergence. And what I mean by that is engineering and and computer science, engineering and architecture, engineering and manufacturing, design, converging. So it is no longer um, plausible for an engineer to create a design, throw it over the transom to fabrication, to manufacturing, and have that manufacturing process um, be played out without the involvement of the designer. These two fields are converging. In architecture, we see prefab construction on the rise, such that a building is no longer a foundation that is poured and then sticks that are erected with two by fours. It is a building that is assembled on site. So we talk about, for example, the Apple campus. If you've been watching that campus um, evolve, it's a neat um, project to take a look at. But um, our CEO talks about that as being an open air factory. So it is not about building the building after it's been designed, but it is about fabricating and assembling the construction. Um, I will be talking to you about a project that I'm actively working on called generative design, um, which is intimately associated with additive manufacturing. So generative design is this notion of designing with algorithms. No longer is the CAD designer simply specifying points, lines, and surfaces in a CAD tool and transcribing the idea that he or she had in their mind into a digital drafting tool. Now, and in, in the future, the CAD designer, the designer, will be specifying their goals and constraints and recruiting the computer to algorithmically derive designs, and not just one design, but multiple design alternatives that satisfy those constraints. Uh, that is generative design. I work in the Autodesk Research Group here in San Francisco. So this is a algorithmically derived bike. And I was having a conversation here earlier. I think, Andre, you were talking about um, a bike that does not need a stem um, or does not need a stay in the back. And it does not if you algorithmically introduce the variations and say, in fact, to our algorithm, which designed this bike, there is an obstacle here. 
don't grow there. Um, what I like about this very simple example is that, and we did this a, a, about a year and a half ago, is that some of these bikes, oh, let's see, not that one, um, that one, you know, that looks like a bike I have in my garage. Some of them do not, in fact, look like a bike I would have in my garage. And that is the, um, the I think, one of the um, opportunities from the human-computer interaction standpoint and the cognitive science standpoint that the algorithmic approach is going to offer you solutions that were highly counterintuitive. Um, how are we doing that? Well, one thing we're doing is capitalizing on multiple trends. One is cloud computing. So high performance computing that's available and accessible to all designers. In fact, our CTO, Jeff Kowalski, said, what is the practice of design that'll look like when every designer has a supercomputer at his or her disposal? And um, that is, in fact, what is available now to designers, but largely what we're seeing the cloud used for is as a massive storage cabinet in the sky. It's not used for its computing power. Um, so what we wanted to do is capitalize on that compute power of the cloud. We also wanted to capitalize on additive manufacturing. This is a failed print, and I intentionally showed you a failed print because that is a lot of what's happening is we're able to theoretically produce any complex form that the designer can design, um, but once it gets to print, it fails. So how do we capitalize on the promise of additive manufacturing on these infinitely complex designs with the aid of infinitely smart, intelligent software? So that's the other thing we wanted to do. And the third is use um, algorithms and machine learning to aid the designer. So those are the three trends that are underpinning this approach in generative design. As I said, generative design is recruiting algorithms to assist the designer. So what I want to do is give you a very simple example. Um, this is a bow. Uh, this bow here was designed by uh, an artist in residence. So we have artists who we bring in to use our software. They can use our off-the-shelf software or our research software. This artist um, had not, was not a bow designer. He was an amateur archer. And he said, you know what? I've seen your generative design demo, something we demoed you know, internally, because it's not a commercially available tool yet. It's a research prototype. And he said, um, I want to do a bow. I want to design a bow. Um, so what he did is he, he scanned his arm holding his bow, the bow that he currently has. This is called a, a recurve bow. So the dynamic energy is absorbed here. This is a structural member. Um, and he scanned his arm. He um, brought that into our prototype software for generative design. This channel, can anybody guess what this channel might be? I mentioned no grow zones. That's an arrow slot. Right. So it's, uh, it's a channel that the arrow needs to pass through. These pesky little things, I need to have a screwdriver be able to assemble this or build this pin in. So these are obstacles in our model. In the fullness of time, we'd like to be able to just assign those as no-grow zones. Um, but this is an immature algorithm. And so we have obstacles. We have interfaces. So these are the interfaces where it's interfacing with this dynamic member here. Um, and we have forces. So this is what you would call a 25 pound raw. So we know the forces on this object. And this was the, this was the design that the algorithm produced. And it produced that through a um, topology optimization approach. But I use that term reluctantly because um, topology optimization is known to mechanical engineers um, as a method to reduce weight. And um, it is always started with a C design. I have done the CAD, and now I'm going to take it into an optimization algorithm to remove weight. So this is not how our algorithm works. We, in fact, simply say, interface here, interface here, uh, um, with, withstand this load here and here, now synthesize from thin air. So that's how the algorithm works. It produced 
not just one, but multiple, and this is, it happens to be a commercial product now, the, the bow, because an artist designed it, and it was its first design out of the system. <coughs> Um, so that is our bow. Um, and let's see. Um, so I wanted to communicate that the algorithms are not just producing one, but they're producing multiple designs. So what you see here is a bike stem. Um, and simultaneously, we've told the algorithm, all right, produce the, the design um, in in steel, produce this design in aluminum, produce this design in titanium, what would it look like? Um, produce this design in polycarbonate for 3D print, what would it look like? Um, so the algorithm is producing multiple design alternatives at once. Here is a drone body. So we said, look, there are four forces operating here where the propellers mount. There is a gravity load of the battery and the camera. What is this drone body going to look like? And this is just one of the many solutions that it produced. So let's say I'm designing a motorcycle swing arm. Have you ever seen a swing arm that looked like that? That is the algorithmically derived swing arm. I just need to identify the obstacles and the forces, and the algorithm will derive that design. Now, there is more than one way to synthesize the design. I've got a supercomputer. Why don't I try multiple synthesis methods? And I can do that um, and arrive at different designs. Um, in this case, um, we were exploring with multiple materials. Down here, it's titanium. And frankly, it looks very anemic to me from an aesthetic standpoint. Up there, it's um, polycarbonate. And I don't think I want to find a motorcycle with a polycarbonate swing arm. But um, you get to see the range of solutions that the algorithm um, arrives at. This is a car chassis. Um, this car chassis uh, was designed by um, a designer specifying the forces. Now, what happens if you take a car chassis and you take a prototype, you sense it, you drive it, and then you take that sensor data and you bring that into the algorithm? What is it going to look like? So in this case, it's doing a topology optimization. That's one form of synthesis algorithm. Um, it's finding that shape. It looks very organic, very bone-like. Um, and then we decide to use that as a seed for a truss algorithm. So that truss algorithm is placing nodes and placing beams. Um, and it's synthesizing that form uh, in an arguably more lightweight form. And we can synthesize that and specify the material to be aluminum, to be titanium. And we're simply using the material definition, the Young's modulus, and the Poisson ratio for those. So we, that has been experimentation. This is a um, partition, an interior partition, a cabin partition for the Airbus A380 um, to be tested over the next few months and to be flying by the end of the year. Uh, it is generatively designed. Um, algorithmically selected among a large competing set of solutions. And um, it was <coughs> printed, 3D printed, using a custom material called scalamoy. Uh, a shoe. You can order this shoe now from Under Armour. Um, and I take you from you know, aerospace to um, you know, athletic apparel to give you a sense for the range of, um, of uh, artifacts that are being produced currently using a generative design approach. So this was done with um, our commercial grade generative design software uh, called Within. Um, and the point I want to leave you with is, again, instead of the designer taking one design that they have conceived of, as brilliant as it is, and transcribing that to a CAD tool they are defining their goals and constraints and allowing the system to offer up a range of solutions, a Pareto front, if you will, of solutions that they can then um, navigate, explore, curate, and select as a seed to continue iterations or to pull out and then fabricate. And that's why I'd like to leave you with generative design. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Aaron. That was uh, fantastic. Really quite amazing. Oh, we have time for a couple of questions if people want to ask. Yeah, that's fine. So are you selling this to other engineering companies as a tool to be able to get rid of the Right, are we selling? Are we selling this? Um, so the tool that you saw here is a research prototype that is um, not commercially available. The tool that was used to design the shoe, for example, is commercially available. It's um, on the Autodesk product list. Uh, the, um, the reason the tool that I demonstrated you, to you um, is not yet commercially available is simply because it was an experiment and then we realized the commercial value of it and we're working diligently to commercialize it. It will likely be componentized and put into our standard product offering as a generative design feature or feature set. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is really fascinating stuff. So I was wondering if you could talk about the, uh, the software a little bit more. Uh, is there, so it sounds like there's some training that's happening. Uh, is this sort of an AI based? Uh, no training. So it is, there is a algorithm that is synthesizing the form um, in much the way bone grows. So it will reinforce, it will deposit material where there is force and remove material where there is not. Um, but it is not taking a, you know, a machine learning approach. It is not um, analyzing a, a set of design alternatives and then either you know, creating a new alternative or synthesizing an alternative. Um, it is growing that form. And we are, we, we plan and are actively working on um, using machine learning approaches to um, meta-optimize, to, to select that synthesis method that's appropriate for the problem, um, and then possibly to seed the designs with existing designs, but that was our, you know, our intention was not to take a machine learning approach at the beginning, it's to synthesize the design from scratch. So I'm going to stop it there. Um, Aaron will hopefully stick around after yeah. and there'll be opportunity to talk with her further. Well, I want to get us back to um, free time and socializing. Um, so uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have with us tonight Professor Chris Phillips from the Department of Informatics in our School of Information Computer Sciences. She was uh, willing to fly up and, and be with us tonight. Um, and she's going to talk about some really fascinating work that she's done um, on simulating cities and, and how that can be um, used in practice in designing cities. Yeah, I'm actually going to trade you next here. All right. Okay. Hello, hi. Uh, <laughs> so, um, hello everybody. I don't know every one of you. I know some of you. I've been at uh, I've been at CS since 2002. Um, so it's been a while, but uh, um, I've been uh, several generations here of uh, alumni, I, I can tell. So, um, pay attention because there will be a pop quiz at the end. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, a, a piece of work that I have been doing over the past few years that is kind of half research and half consulting that I do with a company in Sweden. And this is uh, about simulating cities and it gets as virtual as, as, as you will see here. So, But what I really want to talk about is how um, in the process of doing this work, um, I come to realize that something that I kind of knew already theoretically, but it's very clear in my face that the choices that we make technically, at the, the, the kind of the architecture that we give to our software, um, influences and is intertwined uh, very much with uh, with what we can do socially, right? What uh, the, uh, the social uh, structures of that that we operate in. And so I'll, I'll come back to this, and that, and nothing more clear than actually trying to simulate the city. Um, so let me start with a um, a um, movie of one of our one of the models. Is this full screen? Okay. So well, what you see here is um, one of the models that could be somebody. Um, uh, they operate mostly in Sweden, but they have some budgets here in the US. Sweden, they're much into virtual reality. And they're very socially conscious too. So they, they 
like to make sure that whatever they're doing is actually the right thing and they want to test things early on before actually committing into engineering effort. Um, so what, what uh, this company does and I've been helping them is to build the area in the development in virtual reality. And it's in not just the models, but as you can see, it's animation. Whatever they need to visualize, we come in and we put some, some simulation on. So that's what so this is an area of Uppsala and Sweden, the area around the train station. And this is, by the way, these trains don't exist in Uppsala. They were evaluating whether, so there's a train in Sweden to put uh, these trains all over the big city, so uh, Stockholm has them. And so they were assessing whether they should deploy them also in Uppsala or not. And so they, they worked with some of them to kind of visualize how it would look like to have these trends going around the, the center of the city. So, so that's, that's one, one of the models in there. So um, let me tell you maybe if this comes back. Hello? There, there you go. Okay, all right. So let me tell you what, what, what uh, when you're simulating cities, uh, the way that the urban planners like to think about cities is it's sort of in the layers. There's these layers of cities, right? There's the areas of expertise. You know, there's the water management, energy, community parks, buildings, financial, traffic, shopping, social, you name it. There's a bunch of different things. In fact, you can probably find these different departments in the, in the city governments, right? And they're kind of all operating over the same objects, the same shared uh, resources, which is the city itself, but they are uh, different centers of expertise, different budgets, different people, you know, all of that stuff. It's, it's very clear also in when we are, uh, when we go, go in and try and model some, some of the areas of redevelopment, it's very clear that all of this stratification uh, is there. And so one of the things that, uh, that it has come very, um, um, very important, very urgent. So the first plan is how do you do a platform, a software platform, right? A software infrastructure that allows different people to collaborate in separate, right? So ideally imagine maybe a few years from now what you really want before giving people licenses to build or to operate in the city is that somebody needs to provide not just a document, but a live document, a simulation of some sort. So how would you build a platform that would allow people to actually do that, right? That's sort of the question that I have been asking myself and, and working towards. How would you build an, an infrastructure that would allow you to do that? So just to tell you a, a little bit about how, how these virtual environments currently work. If you have a very large map, right, they call them maps. If you have a very large map that doesn't fit in one server, then you do a partition of some sort, that's like a space partitioning. And you allocate different parts of the space to different servers, and you you know you smooth the borders and all that. Everything works. But and we started doing that. In fact, that's how we started doing these virtual environments. And uh, you know, if you have a traffic simulation going on, and the car goes from one area to another, there's a little uh, uh, hands off that goes in migration of some sort, and this kind of works. But it, it, it was very clear from the beginning that this was not very good, and, and particularly was not very good. You know not just the visual glitches when the cars cross the borders, but in particular was that there was no separation of concerns. Every server runs every aspect. So every server has to have all of those layers. So basically, very concretely, what happened in our own workflow of this company is that every time that I wanted to deploy a traffic simulation, a new version of the traffic simulation, I had to kick out the modelers. I had to out, you know, stop, Go away for two hours. I need to deploy a new traffic simulation. That's that's how it is. It's very disruptive. So for our for our, for our own sake, in the sake, we needed to come up with a different approach for actually uh, working with them. So you know, basically separate the traffic simulator from from the world model, from the world where you know where they build the, the buildings. And so. If you basically avoid all of these problems, and I did that. In fact, the, the video that you saw that I showed you was exactly that. You saw the cars going around, but actually in reality, those cars are actually being simulated by another server, not by 
not by the same server that does the building. So it's a, it's a all an illusion. The world is an illusion. <laughs> uh, just like probably the real universe anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm learning a lot about how physics could actually work by doing simulations. It's fascinating. Uh, so, so this is great. You can separate things, but of course, you know. So here it works. So you have the these are the servers that simulate the model and where the builders build the stuff. And there's a traffic simulation, a little lone server somewhere over here that does actually runs the cars as if they were here. So it runs way outside its borders. And then the viewer is the one that does the magic, you know, sort of merging of all the information and gives the illusion that everything is in the same place. This is great, but. Now there's a problem because uh, there, there, there's new problems. And basically, what happens if you do that is that the cars which are operating on that server down there don't know about the people which are on the mall, right? <laughs> so if you, I, you know, I could, if I were running on my computer, I could show a live demo of my avatar walking into the middle of the street and being run over by a car, <laughs> which is always very dramatic. It has like a. Ugh. But uh, so that's what happens because the, the cars don't know about the people. So so in order to solve that problem, we have to do some sort of an API between all of these different things that could potentially be a mess, right? You would have you know for any one of these aspects, one of these layers that you would separate out, you would have to open up a, a, a communication channel with the others, and it would be an n squared complexity API that. So I I didn't want to go there. So what uh, what I'm what I'm working on is that uh, is on a, a different kind of architecture, designing an, an architecture. I, I will not go into the details here, but let you know talk to me if you want to know. But basically, what we really want to, to have is basically a data store. This is where the data lives. You have the simulation data lives here, right? And you have the simulation units that all pull data from the shared space and in their own terms. You know, and then do whatever they want to do. And simulations actually happen to be executing on this time step kind of deal. So there's a, a loop that goes every so often, you know, 100 milliseconds or something. So they'll go up, get, get the data, work on the local copy of the data, push any potential changes back to the store. And, you know, th that's sort of where we are going here. And uh, the, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. But the idea is that. There's the store over here. All of the different simulations now are relatively independent and separate. So all they need to know is about the data model that is going on here in the data store. But then from knowing the data model, they can pull up the data however they want and however they need. So if this one produces cars, now that this one produces cars, say this is a traffic simulation that produces cars, and the car may be a complex data structure, but if this guy wants the cars, the, vis the visualizer, they may just want the position and the velocity, and they don't want maybe lots of other things. So they, they just pull whatever they need, and they add more things to their version of the car. So it's like there's no real car, right? There's, every one of these has a different view of the car. Um, so uh, I'll skip about this. Now, that we have designed a, a cool little uh, domain-specific language to actually pull and push things from the data store that I'm not going to talk about. It's called predicate collection classes. If somebody is interested in collaborating, this is an open source project that uh, that we have. By the way, this framework is also now called the space-time framework, which is really great because now we're fixing bugs in space-time. <laughs> Uh, we, we also have an ongoing course right now on, on this in which the students are all doing different parts of the traffic simulation. So we have a student doing Uber cars, another student doing Amazon delivery trucks, another student doing residential traffic. So it's going to be really exciting uh, you know, next week when they start all talking to the same data store. <laughs> uh, there are performance considerations. I'm not going to bore you to death with it, but it's it's our initial measurements show that it's possible to do, to optimize the heck out of this to actually um, perform relatively well. But what I really want to talk about is that the software architecture and the social architecture are really intertwined. Basically, the architectural decisions affect how the software is used. So whether you're developing for a desktop, it's like a single standalone application, right? That implies something. Socially, okay. Your software is only is meant to be used just by one person at a time. 
right? And I see that when we're interacting with these stakeholders that are designing or consultants for the city, each one has their own installation of Autodesk or you know, Archicad or whatever, and it's, it's like no, none of them talks to the other two, it's, it's like these silos, right? If you want to design for the web, it's another kind of you know decisions that you make. Every, every, every these architectural decisions affect the revenue model, obviously, depending on you know, but it's the technical decisions that really affect all of these things. Now, I I see the role of the university is that we actually we are free from these commercial interests, so we must provide all of these different options to to educate people about what's possible. What could be, so for example, this idea of having an open platform for, for simulations. Right? That's something that probably uh, very few commercial entities probably might not might be interested because it's it actually by design is something that for interoperability. You have you, you have an open platform that you potentially cannot not control yourself. And so it, you know it's not clear how we make money out of that. But but it's it's very clear that it's the way that you see all these different departments kind of collaborating has to do has to be something like that right something to that to that effect needs to be in place um, so um, anyway so this is sort of what I see the, the role of software engineering research at the university level as opposed to the software engineering practice which I you know like very much but I think we have also a responsibility to look into these other things that you know all of you who work in, in wonderful companies, uh, probably don't have the opportunity to, to, to do because of commercial and financial constraints. So uh, thank you and I hope to talk to some of you more after the, these formal talks. So we have some time for a couple of questions for Krista. Have you tried uh, writing your model? Uh, let's say a football team in LA to see what kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, that's a great example. Yeah. So, so we wanted. Um, I, I ended up not doing that. But one of the scenarios of, of traffic was uh, to have one one of the students in this course do the special events. Right. They would simulate special events, and then the traffic would have to react to that. But that would uh, that would require a little bit more time than what the time that we have. But it's definitely yeah. That's part of the things that we want to do. Did I? Yeah. Okay, so nobody, nobody has been listening to me. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? Your uh, simulation already seems to be very much looking like the uh, traffic flow and what's currently outside the new stadium <laughs> in Santa Clara. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I think you could be able to do that one fairly quickly. <laughs> Right, so I must say, so I was the one who did the traffic simulation, and I, I, I dread calling it traffic simulation because it's more like a traffic illustration than the real traffic simulation. The, the traffic model is really simple, what I've done here. I'm, I've been talking with some people who actually do traffic simulators for, for a living uh, to, to try to hook up using this new architecture that I'm working on, the space time framework, uh, so that they, they can hook their own data generated by the traffic, their traffic simulator into a, a city model uh, that the company has. So did, I, did you really not hear me back there the whole time? Yeah? Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Please. Thank Professor Lopes for our presentation. So, so we have everything going on. We have dead pedestrians <laughs> on the research front. And we have, uh, you know, Dr. Aaron Bradner as uh, Katniss Everdeen. <laughs> Somebody here knows who's Katniss Everdeen. Anyway, uh, look, again, we want to thank you. Uh, please give another round of applause for our host. Uh, you know that we are we are in an active museum, and uh, you, you know I, I noticed that everyone was kind of arranged around the food, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, it is an active museum. Please, uh, if, you, if you haven't taken the opportunity to go around and take a look at all of the different 
uh, exhibits, please do that. Uh, the night is not over yet. We have a couple of things yet to do. Uh, we will have ice cream and desserts. Little, <laughs> you said mini ice cream cones, is that right? We're gonna have sherbets. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna have desserts uh, uh, following this. And uh, also, I wanna uh, bring Hal up. This is, this is a special occasion because this is our last event together. Uh, Hal Stern is now uh, ending his service as dean. I think I told you earlier that he was in his sixth year. He's ending his service. He is moving uh, back to the greatest job <laughs> that any individual at a university can have, and that is a tenured professor. And so I want to thank Hal for the great job. Yes, and, and without further ado, we do have some uh, goodies to hand out to all of you today, and Hal's going to lead that effort. What are we giving away, Chris? Stuff. Stuff. We have four giveaways. Okay. Uh, two for engineering and two for ICS. Oh, okay, great. All right. So, um, here's what we're going to do. Actually, an announcement first for those who actually care. Um, it's a good night for another UCI alum, uh, Joe Lake, who owns the Golden State Warriors. And the, the Warriors are winning big tonight for those who are, Finally. For those who are concerned. <laughs> uh, for those who were concerned after two nights ago. So, um, we often do this with business cards, but nobody brought business cards, including me, so we're not doing that. Um, so, uh, we have two for ICS and two for engineering. So, we're, we're going to start with. Um, Birthday closest to today in ICS. ICS alum birthday closest to today. Shout them out. May 18th, I believe. April. April. Somebody have May? March. <laughs> Nobody has May? It's a famous birthday problem. Um, okay. Nobody has May. So we have late April. What's your April? Mid-April. Mid-April. Don't wake up. Wow. All right. Wait, can you hear your ICS alone? These ICS? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm giving you the wrong bag. You might want an engineering shirt. Thank you so much. Engineering. February. Anybody ever February? All right. Yeah, I wanted to. Let's take a picture. Oh, May 11th is going to be hard to beat. Yeah, May 26th. Oh, May 22nd. May 22nd wins, I think. All right, May 22nd. Come on up. <laughs> Engineering. Engineering. Woo. Engineering. We need Thank pictures with the deans after. All right. There is a price with these. You have to actually take a picture with the dean. <laughs> Nothing is free. Nothing is free. Um, so uh, I'm very bad at this. Um, so I guess the only thing I can think of other than that is um, let's go the other six months away. So uh, for this birthday from today. <laughs> so today Come on, you got that right here? Um, do you? Think of something. It's not so easy, Kristen. No. I, I even Googled it. There's <laughs> Middle name. Let's start with an A. A to A to A, 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 like Aaron, A, A, Aaron. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> um, the minute you were born. Okay, whatever. I know. <laughs> ah, I have. That's a great answer. I have one. Oh, no, I have it. That's, I, I got this. This is done. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, I asked you by year uh, to raise your hands, and so what I would like to know is the individuals who graduated after or. Actually, before <laughs> 1980, please raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Then 1980, please raise your hands. Keep your hands up. No, does it count? Does dropping count? If you attended the institution before 1980, raise your hand. Okay, before 1980. Before 1975. Oh. Before. 1972. Attended or graduated? Attended. Oh. Before 1970. Before 1965. Nobody in this. Nobody should be. Okay, what year? 68. 
What year? 69. Outstanding. You win, my friend. I can't raise here. I can't. 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 Okay. But we, we only, it's engineering. Ask the engineer. Thank you. Yes, I know. <laughs> now, the engineers are all Johnny come late these to this. <laughs> Those of you with engineering, anybody before 1980? Anybody before 1990? Young whippers. <laughs> anybody before 2000? <laughs> Oh. You are the one. Oh, two. We got two. What year? How many years? 1999. What year? 98. Oh. Okay. That's okay. Okay, we pictures. Everybody. You received the prize. Oh. Thank you, guys. Thank you.